Greetings, potential Octopathians. This is the continent of Orstera, a mysterious and mythical land, which we don't know much about at this point, despite the fact we've had two demos and plenty of trailers, but will be the site of our adventure come July 13th. And our story will be shepherded by eight individuals with distinct classes and abilities, as well as their own individual stories. And while this game's being marketed on choose your adventure, choose your character, and follow their story to the end, after playing two demos of this and looking at the lore contained within, I have reason to believe that there is an overarching background story to the whole game, and that is what will connect each of the protagonists together in the end, and could lead to a common endgame. So where does this theory begin? Well first we must venture back to the beginnings of the continent itself. This opening excerpt from Ophelia's opening chapter is as follows. In the beginning, the thirteen gods created the land. They shaped the mountains, filled the seas, and gave life to mighty trees and myriad beasts. And then they created men, who would become masters of the land. Yet one god, Galdera, was too greedy to part with his creations. And so, the twelve deities of good were forced into a desperate struggle with the cruel Galdera, lord of the most infernal of magics. In the end, the conflict was brought to a close by Aelfric, the Flamebringer, lord of all that is holy. Aelfric called astral fire down upon Galdera, sapping his strength, and then sealed him away in the afterworld. A divine flame to chase the shadows. This is the sacred flame that shines down upon the land of Orstera, bringing warmth and guidance to its people. The divine flame in question used by Eofric to defeat Galdera is known as the First Flame. And no, this is not the same First Flame from Dark Souls, there's no chosen undead in this game, ages of fire and darkness and what have you. No, this First Flame is of religious importance and is the center of a pilgrimage which must take place every 15 years on the continent. Whoever undertakes the pilgrimage must take the First Flame and relight the braziers across the land. As for the exact function that this pilgrimage serves, nobody knows, but it is carried out for the sake of tradition, and whoever bears the flame and takes it across the land has become the target of assassination attempts in the past. As for why these assassins are targeting the flame bearer, nobody knows. However, this pilgrimage has been completed uninterrupted every 15 years for many centuries on the continent. And in the many centuries that this pilgrimage took place, so did the continent enjoy many centuries of peace and prosperity. However, with any peace, it is doomed to end eventually. And merely a couple of decades before Octopath Traveler begins, mysterious things begin to happen. The first of these events is the theft of a very ancient tome from the city of Atlas Dam, the city of scholars, titled From the Far Reaches of Hell. This tome is said to house the most arcane of magics and arcane knowledge. And one could surmise it is the Octopath Traveler version of the Necronomicon. Mercedes, librarian and caretaker of the Special Archives of Atlas Dam, discloses to Cyrus during his opening chapter that this tome has been missing for a very long time and that it was a tremendous loss for the city. Now, it is important to note that From the Far Reaches of Hell was stolen from a collection in the Special Archives, and in these archives, these tomes are considered too dangerous to, for the public to be allowed to see them, and they are only allowed to, for use in academic purposes, no citations allowed. And being that the tome is the most arcane in the entire collection, there is no telling what its contents are being used for. Though I may have an idea of what. However, before I get into what I think the tome is being used for, there are some other important incidents that I need to cover that take place right after this. So, fast forward to 10 years before Octopath Traveler begins, and we had the assassination of Jeffrey Azelhart, Primrose's father and the Lord of House Azelhart. It is in this incident that Primrose is hiding from a group of three assassins with crow tattoos on the different parts of their bodies, and she watches firsthand as they assassinate her father for apparently knowing too much about something, something that he wasn't supposed to know but it's from that day that she swears her revenge, and that's how her story begins. As for who these assassins are associated with or who contracted them to kill Lord Azelhart, that is unknown. However, around the time of Lord Azelhart's assassination, there is a plague going around the continent called the Great Pestilence. 
No apothecary in their village knows how to treat this plague. Except for one. There is a wandering apothecary that went village to village curing the great pestilence. And he's the one that ends up curing Alfin the apothecary when he's but a small child. It isn't explained in Alfin's opening chapter how this mysterious apothecary knows how to cure the great pestilence other than that he just knows and that he was claiming to just help people in need. But I suspect there's more to this man than meets the eye, but we won't know anything until the final release. However, regardless of who this mysterious apothecary was, the plague was eradicated, and life went on, at least for another two years, as a war would break out to, that would shake the entire continent. The War of Hornburg. At the time of the War of Hornburg, Sir Ulrich Eisenberg, the Unbending Blade, is one of two retainers to King Alfred. As their kingdom is besieged by an unknown enemy, Ulrich personally led the armies of Hornburg into battle against the invading enemy force and is successful in repelling their attack. However, he is dismayed when he returns to camp to find all the soldiers have been killed. Arriving at the King's tent, he finds King Alfred on his knees before his other retainer, Sir Erhard and Sir Erhardt strikes him down on the spot, with Ulbrich asking why he would do such a thing. Erhardt gives no answer, and proceeds to duel Ulbrich, eking out a victory just barely. And Hornburg then falls into ruin due to a bloody coup, and with it, all of its knowledge, archives, their history, anything pertaining to the religious order upon which they were founded, royal blood, it's all destroyed, presumably. As a result of the fall of Hornburg, Ulbrich is forced into exile, in shame that he could not defend country and king, and thus he settles down in Cobbleston. And then from there, eight years pass, upon which Octopath Traveler begins if we pick up with the stories of our heroes. When the game begins, the 15-year pilgrimage is about to begin again, with Sister Leanna, daughter of Archbishop Joseph who did the previous pilgrimage, preparing for her trip to the Cave of Origin to obtain the first flame. Leanna's adoptive sister, Sister Ophelia, is tasked with staying behind at Flame's Grace to help Archbishop Joseph run the church. However, Archbishop Joseph suddenly falls ill and Leanna has to stay at his side. And Ophelia, against Archbishop Joseph's wishes, heads to the Cave of Origin and obtains Eofric's Lanthorn by herself, and proving to the Guardian of the First Flame that she is worthy of taking on the pilgrimage. Enraged yet accepting of what happened, Archbishop Joseph gives his blessing for Ophelia to take on the pilgrimage in Leanna's place, though she's only given an abridged version of what to expect in the pilgrimage and what her objectives are, as well as being warned that she will be beset on all sides by friend and foe alike, those who will help with the pilgrimage and those who wish to see her fall. Assassins, rogues, heretics, no matter the cost she must complete this pilgrimage, as no one knows what happens should the pilgrimage end in failure. However, as Ophelia was being deemed worthy of taking on the pilgrimage, various strange events start happening across the continent witnessed by our different protagonists. In the Whisperwood to the west, the Huntress Hanet reminisces on the departure of her master Zanta one year prior. He was contracted by the Knights Ardon to slay a fell beast known as the Red Eye, a beast of unfathomable power and upon which no one knows its origin. But seeing as how he has never failed to hunt, he accepted the challenge but Hanit is concerned when he does not return for one year. However, trouble hits close to home at the village of Swarky as Hanit learns of a beast attacking merchants on the road through the Whisperwood. She tracks down the monster in question and finds out it's a Gisarma, a very strong beast, but it has strayed from its natural habitat and is seeking to kill both humans and the animals of the forest for sport. Troubled by the beast's unusual behavior, Hanit is forced to kill it. Returning to the village with the contract completed, Hanid is surprised to find her master's pet wolf Hagen waiting for her. She finds him whimpering and warning that something has happened to Zanta. Sensing her master is in danger, Hanid proceeds to leave her village in search for him and if necessary kill the Red Eye. However, as Hanid was hunting the Gisarma, down south in Boulderfall, the infamous thief Therion is preparing for the heist of his career as he breaks into the Ravis Manor. He breaks into the manor only to find that there is no fabled treasure as he's been led to believe by rumors in the town, only to find a mysterious jewel sitting upon a pedestal. As Therion attempts to leave, he's intercepted by the Ravis family butler, Heathcote, and he finds that he is a more than formidable match as Heathcote is strangely well trained in the arts of combat. Therion barely ekes out a victory, 
However, the victory is bittersweet as Heathcote slaps on a bangle onto Therion's wrist. This is the bangle of shame, and it's supposed to represent where a thief has failed to pull off a heist and their reputation is therefore ruined. As Therion demands that the bangle be removed, Lady Ravis appears and she gives Therion a proposition. She explains that the jewel on the pedestal is a dragonstone and is but one of a set of four. The Ravis family once held all four dragonstones, however they were stolen by an unknown rogue or a group of rogues. Heathcote on his own managed to recover one of the four stones, however they've had no luck finding the rest. And from there, Lady Ravis strikes a deal with Therion, return the remaining three dragonstones and they shall remove the bangle of shame from his wrist. Without being much, left much of a choice, Therion accepts the job. However, it is implied that perhaps Lady Ravis and Heathcote know more about the Dragonstones than they're letting on. However, as Therion was undertaking his heist of the Ravis Manor in the Riverlands to the south, we find out that a Alfin has grown up into a young man who is following the footsteps of the mysterious apothecary that cured him of the Great Pestilence. Through rigorous training, he has become the village's apothecary, and a very good one as he's able to cure his best friend's sister of the venom of a blotted viper, a very rare type of snake found in the nearby riverlands. Despite all Alfred's wondrous work in his village, he finds himself unsatisfied being confined to such a small village. However, he finally decides to strike out on his own and leave, perhaps maybe in the one day in the hopes of finding the man who cured him some ten years ago. Meanwhile, in the east, among the scorching sands of an arid desert, lies the city of Sunshade. And here, we find a grown-up Primrose, who is now a skilled dancer. She obtains information finding that one of the three assassins that murdered her father often frequents the city of Sunshade for some unknown reason. And waiting for her chance, she finds herself in the employ of Helganish, who is essentially the city mob boss. Helganish uses his army of thugs to control commerce throughout the city, as well as personally owning an entertainment theater where alcohol is served as well as a brothel where his dancers can have one-on-one -on -one sessions with his clients in the theater. Primrose is disgusted to have to be employed by such a low life of a man. However, she knows this is the only way she's going to be able to spot out the assassin that murdered her father. Her patience pays off. As she's entertaining one of the other guests in the theater, she spots the assassin having a business deal with one of the other clients. Risking the anger of Hilganish, she goes outside and happens to spy on a meeting where the assassin and Hilganish are meeting in secret in a back alleyway. We come to find out through the secret meeting that the assassins are running a human trafficking ring trafficking females and Hilganish has been the one providing them to them. As for the purpose of these women, that is unknown. Though the assassin implies it's for pleasure, it could be for something else. Pursuing the assassin into the sunshade catacombs, she emerges out in the desert to find that she has lost the assassin, but instead runs directly into Helganish, who punishes Yusufa, one of Primrose's friends, for her insubordination. And when Helganish delves out punishment, it is severe, as he kills Yusufa right in front of her. This enrages Primrose to the point that she decides to kill her employer. She finds a map on Helganish that might be able to lead her to where the assassin went. So she decides to leave Sunshade in pursuit of the assassin. As Primrose sets out, the sto our story pivots northeast into the Highlands, where we find Ulbrick still continuing his life in exile in Cobblestone, who has found work being a man-at-arms for the village, defending it from brigands and training the young men in the ways of war. However, a surprise attack by a group of brigands to the north takes the village by surprise, and a young boy named Philip is kidnapped. Ulbrich chases the brigands to their den in the mountains, where he encounters their leader, Gaston. However, Ulbrich is shocked to find Gaston wielding a very familiar sword, Earhart's sword. Ulbrich initially demands to know where Gaston got the sword, but Gaston agrees to tell him if he wins in fair combat. Ulbrich and Gaston duel with Ulbrich winning, and Gaston explains that he and Earhart were part of a mercenary band and that they did many contracts together before the band broke up. And Gaston suggests to Ulbrich that if he wishes to find Earhart, he should seek out the Black Knight in Victor's Hollow, because then he may finally get some answers as to why he slew King Alfred. From there, Ulbrich dons his old Hornburg knight armor and sets out. From here, we pivot our story to the north, to the story of the merchant Tressa, who is living out a quiet life in her home port town. But everything changes one day when a vessel 
comes into port with an exotic merchant aboard. Tressa can't help but wonder what's on the ship that she might be able to see, as she's interested in fabulous treasures. However, after speaking with the captain of the ship and the exotic merchant Captain Leon, he says that he only does business with those who he thinks he deems worthy. However, just as the conversation between Tressa and the captain are coming to an end, they find that pirates are harassing the villagers of Ripple and in the process, many possessions are stolen, including a bottle of rainbow wine that Tressa had just bought. After witnessing the pirates' behavior, Captain Leon agrees to help Tressa. And after some clever hijinks and clever planning on Tressa's part, she manages to get into the pirate's den, where she attempts to steal back everything that the pirates stole. However, Tressa's plan falls apart and is forced to confront the two wannabe captains, Mick and Mac. She succeeds in combat against them, but being the unhonorable pirates that they are, they summon their entire crew to fight her. However, Captain Leon comes in and puts a stop to the fighting, and Mick and Mac recognize him as the infamous Pirate Lord, and all the pirates flee from the cave. Captain Leon explains then to Tressa that he's no longer a Pirate Lord, and he just seeks a humble life as a merchant now. And he invites her back to his ship, and he, she is allowed to take any treasure off the boat that she wishes, but she can only pick one. The treasure that Tressa ultimately chooses is a shining gem inside of one of Leon's treasure chests. Now the game does not show exactly what it looks like up close, but L Captain Leon asserts that it won't sell for very much. However, Tressa insists on having it, saying that it's calling to her. Now this could very well be one of the dragon stones. And being that Leon was an infamous pirate lord, it could have came into his possession some way or another. Finally from Ripple we head north to Atlas Dan, the city of scholars. Cyrus Albright, a professor at the university, is intrigued by the vast amounts of knowledge that are in the library and archives of the royal family. However, he finds himself in hot water as one of his students spreading rumors of a scandal between him and the princess, as he's the princess's direct tutor. However, just before the scandal comes up, he learns about the disappearance of the tome from the far reaches of hell, and he wants to go on an adventure to look for it and find its secrets. However, his tenure at the university prevented him from doing so until the scandal arose in which he's put on sabbatical. But being put on sabbatical allows him to look for the tome. And as he's setting out from Atlas Dam, one of the three assassins that killed Jeffrey Azelhart is watching him leave. And it's at this point that all eight protagonists set out on their adventures for their varying reasons. Now, let's put it all together. We have the dark god Galdera who's been sealed in the underworld by Aelfric, a pilgrimage which must take place every 15 years where the first flame rekindles braziers across the land or there could be consequences, the theft of the arcane tome from the far reaches of hell, housing ar arcane magics and knowledge, the murder of Geoffrey Azelhart, the appearance of the great pestilence and the mysterious apothecary who's the only one who knew how to cure it, the Hornbergian War, where vast amounts of knowledge and history were either seized or destroyed by the invading force, the murder of King Alfred, upon which we do not know Earhart's reasons for doing so, the appearance of the fell beast with the Red Eye, the theft of the Dragonstones, whose powers remain a mystery, and then the reappearance of the assassins in both Sunshade and Atlas Dan. Based on the lore provided here, I have come to the conclusion that there is a secret organization or cult behind most of these events. Their mission? To break the Dark God Galdera out of his prison in the underworld by any means necessary. I suspect that the reason the pilgrimage has to take place every 15 years is because if the Berziers are not rekindled across the land with the first flame, the seal on Galdera will weaken and he will break free. However, the church has managed to perform this pilgrimage without fail every time it has had to be done. This cult may have sent assassins each pilgrimage to try to cause it to end in failure, but they have, well, failed every time. So I think as part of their recourse, the first action they took was to steal the tome from the far reaches of hell, in the hope that there was a spell in the book that would let them unseal Galdera. And Jeffrey Azelhart may have found out too much about this cult, and they sent their assassins to have him killed for it. And also, they may have been the cause of the Great Pestilence as well as part of their experiments with arcane magics. And as for the mysterious apothecary who knew how to cure it, he may have been part of this cult or organization at one time. Hence why he would know how to cure it. In fact, he may have been one who researched the Great Pestilence well, as part of their employ. As for the fall of Hornburg, they may have been the ones responsible for convincing Earhart to kill King Alfred as they may have sought the knowledge 
of the kingdom itself, and they stole all they could amongst the chaos. As for the Dragonstones, it's possible that the assassins or other rogues in under their employ may have stolen the Dragonstones for an unknown purpose. In fiction, Dragonstones house immeasurable magical power, so they may be wanting to use those for those their purposes. Or, it's also possible that Heathcote and Lady Ravis may be part of the organization and they're wanting the Dragonstones back for the purposes of resurrecting Galdera. Then you have the creature Red Eye, which much like the, the Great Pestilence, could have also been another experiment of arcane magic rituals. It's possible the Red Eye may be a demon of hell that was summoned using the tome from the far reaches of hell and was let loose upon the land killing anything it saw. And then let's not forget the appearance of the assassins in Atlas Dam and Sunshade. Sunshade first with the human trafficking ring. The assassin implied that he needed women for pleasure, but it's fully possible that the women Helgenish were trafficking to the assassins may be being used as sacrifices for dark and arcane rituals using the tome. As for the assassin who watched Cyrus leave Atlas Dam, that may have been just to monitor him to make sure that he doesn't know too much or he doesn't get too close to finding out that they have the tome. Now, after stating all that, I believe that this organization is going to be the glue that binds all the protagonist's stories together. This could also be the mechanism upon which their stories could intersect as well, so I'll give an example. Say Therion manages to track down one of the Dragonstones. Well, one of the Dragonstones could be in possession of one of the three assassins, which Primrose is chasing down. Also, if this idea of an overarching story with this organization is true, this could also give every story in the same endgame to work towards, where the final boss for every character is going to be the Dark God Galdera after he's been unsealed from the Underworld. And if every character shares a similar endgame, then we could have a Chrono Trigger situation where certain things could cause the endgame to happen earlier rather than just taking one protagonist story all the way to completion to trigger it. However, everything I've just said about the endgame here is speculation on my part, as there's no evidence from the prologue demo or the promotional materials that this is the way it's going to work. But I'm excited at the possibilities nonetheless, and I hope if you're thinking of looking into the game, you might be too. But all shall be revealed on July 13th when the game comes out. So, what'd you all think of my first lore slash speculation video? I had quite a, fun, a lot of fun making this, to be honest, and I hope you all enjoyed it. So, if you enjoyed the video, make sure you like, comment, subscribe, or if you really, lo really, really loved it, share it with your friends. If this does well enough, I might make more of these in the future, especially on Octopath, because I'm really excited for this game. So with that, I'll say thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you all next time. Bye.